Good evening. Last time we were together and I was speaking, we started a new series called Grace, uh, Graceful. And as we began this series, we began it with a bold claim. We said that you do not understand God if you do not understand grace. You do not understand God if you do not understand grace. And we looked at a fantastic story from the Gospel of John about Peter interacting with Jesus after Jesus' resurrection and how it showed us in a graphic and unforgettable way that God gives grace. That is his unearned, undeserved favor and love. And he gives it to us in a myriad of ways because that is who he is. He gives grace. That is what God does. And last time we said that when God saves us from sin and death, he saves us by grace. It is a gift. It is not earned. It is not by works. And we made an attempt to differentiate between what we often hear from religion and what we hear from God in his grace. Religion often says, change and you can join us. You get everything right with your life and then you can come and we might consider welcoming you into the church at that point. Change and you can join us. But Jesus, however, says, no, 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 you join us and you will change. Change and you can join us versus what God in his grace says, which is join us and you will change. We'll get into more of that idea as we continue through this series together next week. But the bottom line that we're starting with tonight is that God gives grace. That is who he is. That is what he does. It is fundamental to his makeup and praise him for that. I am so glad that that is the case. That is in so many ways our only true hope is God deciding to extend grace to you and me. But it's at this point in our discussion in this explanation of these topics and these uh, conceptual ideas that we are wrestling with that I need to say something clearly. Here is what God will not do. We've made it abundantly clear what God will do. God gives grace. Now let's make it abundantly clear what God does not do. He will not, God will not force his grace on you. God gives grace. He gives it abundantly, but God will not force his grace on you. That's why if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a follower of Jesus because you are given that prerogative. You are allowed, you have been enabled to make that decision for yourself and empowered to do so. God has chosen to not force himself to be a part of your life. He has chosen to not force you to follow Jesus. He has not put us under any duress and forced us to be cleaned or forced us to find peace in his spirit. God will not do that to you. He will not force grace upon you. So the question that then emerges is how? If God will not force his grace on you, how do you accept it? He will not force you to take it. You must choose to follow him. So how do you do that? What does that look like? How does that work? That's our focus for tonight. And one of the great places in scripture that speaks to that question is Ephesians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. This, by the way, if you're not familiar with the book of Ephesians, is a letter written by one of the chief messengers that Jesus sent out after his death, burial, and resurrection. He got a late start, but did pretty well for himself after the fact. His name is Paul, formerly known as Saul, and he used to be against Jesus, but he changed. And that, in turn, changed the rest of his life. And so Paul goes on to write about half of the New Testament. And here, Paul is writing to the Ephesians and the church of Ephesus. This is as you might have guessed, the ancient city of Ephesus. And so we're picking up in about the same place we did last time in chapter 2 together. But we'll dig up some more of the context than we did last time. Starting in chapter 2, verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the inc incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
so that no one can boast. And what that means is that never, as a Christian, are we in a position, once we have obeyed God, once we've started doing good things that he commanded, or having helped other people, or loved well, or remained pure, or whatever, never are we in a position to start saying, but, but God, I, I did this. Do you know how many things I've done for you? How hard it was for me to do those things? Do you know how bad I wanted to cheat, to lie, to take things that did not belong to me? I did not do that for you, God, so really you kind of owe me. We're tempted to think like that at times, but we are never in a position to say that that is wrong. You have no claim on God. What you do have, though, which is much more important, is a promise. A promise from God and every expectation for him to keep that promise because he is good. Part of that promise is this, that what he gives by grace can only be received through faith. God promises marvelous, marvelous things and he keeps that promise. But also inherent in that promise is this, in order to receive the benefits of that promise, we must have faith. Faith is required for you to experience grace. So, there is, uh, by the way, before we get further into this discussion about faith and really what that is, an idea I want to stop just for a minute and sit with together. Uh, I want to stop here and show you how what we're discussing tonight is kind of like one of those and moments that we discussed in a sermon series I did last summer where we looked at how sometimes there are these ideas in the Bible that seem contradictory but actually work together in unison. And I would suggest that this is one of those and moments because first in terms of experiencing salvation God is the one who does the heavy lifting as we will see in a minute we are involved in the process but make no mistake about it God is the one who does all of the hard stuff when it comes to salvation grace God's offer is humongous in terms of size in terms of effectiveness in terms of what enables all of this to happen in our lives it's all about the gift it's all about that offer I'm pretty sure that's why the song is amazing grace and not something like amazing faith uh, I don't think that's a song at least it shouldn't be a song in my mind, uh, the grace that comes from God is an amazing thing. So in a discussion of grace versus faith, faith pales in comparison in regards to grace, in regards to God's gift of grace. In no way, shape, or form does your faith ever stack up to what God does for you with his grace. That is the starting point. And at the same time, Faith is a huge part of this in terms of the importance of it in this whole greater dynamic. Our acceptance of God's gift in this tiny piece that God has engineered to be absolutely essential despite how tiny it is in comparison with his grace. So, maybe a good way for us to think about this at this time is with all of this stuff over here. And before you get your hopes up, I don't want to disappoint anyone tonight. There is absolutely no magic about to happen. If you're like me and I see a guy with like a, t a tablecloth and some pitchers of water and stuff, I'm thinking magic. I'm not doing magic tonight. Although I will tell you, I'll let you in on a little secret. He wouldn't want me to say this. Sean did very much want to be my assistant tonight. He did ask about it. I had to tell him no. He didn't really have the look that I was going for, but I appreciated the enthusiasm. So, no magic. Just a picture that I think is helpful. So, in this picture, I have, as you might have guessed, water. And in this uh, mason jar, that's what these are called, that my actual assistant, Emma Montanen, supplied me with, uh, no water, right? That is how this works. So this has water, this has no water, right? I think we're following here with me so far. So, what I'm going to try to do is I'm now going to attempt to fix that. And we still don't have any water. Why is that? Theory one, this is a cruddy pitcher. It does not do the job that it's supposed to do. Maybe you're sitting there because everyone's an armchair critic and you're thinking, I have the wrong angle. If I had just poured it a little bit better, this would have had water in it, right? 
No, that doesn't actually hold any water. See what I did there? That's a pun. That theory doesn't hold any water when you think about it because this is a pretty easy solution. I just need to take the lid off the jar. And just like that, water goes in. So, what changed? Uh, did the pitcher suddenly get better at doing its job? Did this mason jar just work hard enough, pull itself up by its bootstraps and fill itself with water? No. I just took the lid off. You see, originally, when we started this little experiment, the jar was not in a position to receive water. It was, uh, it was being blocked by something. The pitcher did not change. Nothing changed about the water. Ah, this works fine. I'll take care of that later. It wasn't that there wasn't opportunity. It wasn't that something was wrong with the pitcher or the water, or even in this case, the pourer. I mean, not in this particular example. I guess you could argue there's some things wrong with me, but that's a whole other discussion. It's simply that the vessel was not postured in a way where it could benefit from the flow of the resource. So, if the pourer is God and the water is his grace, then the jar is, of course, you and me. And taking the lid off, I would argue, is what faith is. When you respond to faith, it is you opening yourself up to receive the flow of grace that is already happening and never stops, and by the way, will never stop. The only thing that can keep you out of the flow of grace is you refusing to open yourself up and make yourself available to what God is already freely trying to give you. In other words, faith is our open hands under the fountain of God's grace. Faith is our open hands under the fountain of God's grace. And when you're there with your open hands under this incredible flow of this incredible resource, never would anyone in their right minds look at their hands and say, wow, I am pretty awesome. Way to go me, being here right now, getting this water all by myself. That's not how this works. You thank the source. You recognize that it is the source that you have to thank, and you just happen to show up and do a tiny but indispensable part of all of this by enabling yourself to receive what was actually there all along. This is why Paul, I think, says all of the stuff that he does in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. And if you read this chapter in full, you notice that he see, it seems like he's almost bouncing back and forth like a pinball, making statements and then qualifying statements and then more statements and then more qualifying statements. He's saying it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this isn't from yourself. It's the gift of God so that no one can boast. And then he pinballs back to faith in verse 10, which is where we're going to pick up next week because we're plugging sermons now. But this is what faith and grace are. Grace is God's incredibly generous offer. It flows out of him and it never stops. And all he asks is for us to open our hands. All he asks is for us to respond in faith. And when we do that, it earns nothing. It is of absolutely no credit to you in any way, shape, or form. But it still has to be done by you not because you're working not because you're going to earn your salvation but because if the jar is not open the water can't get in we have to answer we have to receive the gift that has been offered in faith is basically trusting faith is trusting that god is who he says he is and that he will do all that he has promised to do so, whatever it would look like for you to trust that God is who he says he is, if he says he's all-powerful, if he says he's your father who wants good things for you, if he says he is your rock, if he says he is your redeemer, if he says he is your savior, if it is trusting that he is all of those things and so much more and that he will do everything that he has promised to do for you. For instance, 
If God promises that he will be with us always and never leave us or forsake us, if the almighty God of the universe has promised to be with you until the very end of time, and you trust that he is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do, then your life should look drastically different than someone who believes that they are alone in the universe. Because you just act differently when you know you have someone in your corner, right? Whatever that looks like, whatever the difference is, practically speaking, between you not trusting, not leaning into, not putting your weight on the identity and promises of God, and you doing those things, you trusting, you leaning into, you putting your weight and identity into the promise of God, whatever practically speaking divides those two realities for you, that is the absence of faith and faith. Those are the categories you're wrestling between there. And when you choose to walk in faith, when you choose to operate from a posture of faith, then you benefit from the incredible resource of grace. Jesus was, by the way, a big fan of faith. In fact, if we just look at a few of his statements just from the Gospel of Matthew, we find things like this. For example, when he was impressed with a Roman centurion and says, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Matthew 8, 10. Jesus says to the apostles as they freak out when things get hard instead of trusting in him, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Matthew 8, 26, to a woman who is in need, he says, your faith has healed you. This might make you stop for a second. I thought, I thought Jesus healed her, right? Well, he did. Did she work for that? Did she earn that healing? No, she came to Jesus with her faith, and he, that enabled him to heal her. She allowed Jesus to pour grace into her life, and he manifested that in physically healing her. As he's healing a blind man, he says, according to your faith, let it be done to you in Matthew 9, 29. I think that one's particularly interesting for our discussion tonight because it's as if the absence of faith would have impeded what God was trying to do in his life. Almost like it was a lid in the way of water. When his apostles asked, hey, why couldn't we cast that demon out? He said, because you have so little faith. And then he goes on to say, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. If and when you have faith, Jesus says, nothing is impossible for you. And I'm inclined to ask, do we really believe that? Do we actually practically believe that nothing is impossible if we just keep putting our faith into God? That's just a freebie thought for you to ponder on. And so uh, we begin to get the idea if we hang out with Jesus for any amount of time, if we read scripture to any extent, we get the clear message from God that he is a God of grace. He gives grace, and in order for us to receive that grace, we must answer that offer with our faith. So here's a good question, I think, in light of all of this so far, in light of how good grace is and all the wonderful things that flow into us as a result of grace, and in light of the fact that faith will allow that grace to be experienced by us to enable grace in our lives, and in light of the sensuality of faith and the goodness of God through his grace, what must happen in my heart and in my head for me to accept and receive and rely on God's grace. Because I think if you just go up to someone and say, well, you have faith, and they don't have a, a strong Christian background, they're just going to look at you like you're crazy and say, okay, and what does that mean? Most people who don't currently have a bunch of faith or most people who have grown up all their life surrounded by the word faith and have never really stopped to think about it and unpack what that means don't know where to go after saying, okay, God gives grace and to get grace I have to be, have faith. Do I have faith? And that's where things get a little bit tricky. So we start asking, okay, tell me more. What does that mean exactly? What has to happen inside of me in order to accept and receive and rely on your grace, God? 
Let me just offer a couple of thoughts on this. Number one, and I would say this is like number one, like this is the most important. These things are awaited this time. Number, would be, number one would be an awareness of our need. You have to have an awareness of your need. Now this is developed in various ways, often in surround sound as we live and start interacting with God through his word and hanging out around uh, his people and spending any time at all around Jesus or his apostles or his church. But eventually we begin to suspect and soon we get confirmation that our suspicions were in fact correct that we cannot do things on our own. That I am in no way, shape, or form by myself enough. Which runs very counterculture to what we're often told today. That I cannot, in fact, be who I want to be or even who I should be on my own. And we begin to learn more and more and we begin to realize, oh, scratch that. I'm not even being who God wants me to be. And if you're like me, it's hard enough sometimes being who I want to be. It's hard enough sometimes being who I think I should be, let alone who the God, the holy God of the universe thinks that I should be. You and I are in grave need especially when the consequences of breaking God's law, not being who he wants us to be, is death. The wages of sin being death makes this a very pressing matter. And so I am in a bad spot if I'm a human being who happens to not be perfect. I've heard that's most of us, but I haven't really done any deep study into that. And so what I need is an awareness of my needs. In other words... We have to stop pretending that everything is okay. You have to stop because you are not okay. You are not okay alone. You cannot do this by yourself. You can't be who God wants you to be by yourself. You're not capable of it. You can't get out of the sin problem that you have by yourself. You can't escape the monster of death by yourself that is constantly nipping at your heels, both literally and spiritually. You don't have what it takes. And I don't have what it takes. Whether you realize it or not, whether you are willing to be honest with yourself about it or not, You have great need, and so do I. And we have to stop acting as if everything is okay. Isn't it so strange that the one place where we're actually supposed to be totally transparent about everything going on in our lives is a place where we often feel like we have to pretend the most about what's going on in our lives. I truly believe that Portland Church of Christ and just the church in general should be a place where you never have to pretend. You should be able to come here at whatever stage of life you are in and be brutally honest and transparent about where you are at. You are going to want to pretend throughout that process and some people might even make you feel like you need to pretend throughout that process and that just shows that they have a very small understanding of what God intended this church to be. But I am telling you, the church, the body of Christ, is not a group where you should have to pretend. In fact, it should be the only place in the world where you can be real 100% of the time. That doesn't mean everything is going to fly. That doesn't mean everyone's going to give a pass to everything that you ever do or ever think. But you can be honest. You should be able to be honest here. You should never have to put up a front you shouldn't have to pretend to be someone that you are not. You might have someone that you want to be. You might have to be someone that you're striving to be and you're not there yet. I would put myself in that category. But this is not a place for facades and fronts and hypocrisy. Those should never be welcome here, much less should they ever feel encouraged. Now, even when we're striving for that, does it happen at times? Yeah. 
Has anybody here ever pretended that things are a little bit better than they actually are? I guess that's a yeah too. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand for that one because I would hate to encourage you to, uh, to commit the sin of lying about it right now, right here. We all have done that, but we have to start moving towards a place as a community where we put less energy into pretending and more energy into presenting ourselves as we really are and learn to show up every single day before God admitting our need. This is not a place where you're expected to be perfect. In fact, this is a place where we should all be brutally aware of the fact that we are not perfect. And we should be able to love and encourage and help correct, but also to extend grace to one another in times and periods and seasons of growth and change. And that is a huge part of faith. You're not going to rely on someone that you don't think you need. If you are not constantly aware of the fact that you need God's grace, no matter how good you are, no, no matter how good you think you are, you need God's grace. You are desperate for God's grace. And so am I. But here's something that follows closely on the heels of that. What's necessary in an addition to an awareness of need is an observation of God's ability to meet my need. An awareness of need that's coupled with an observation of God's ability to meet my need. I watch and I read and I see who God is and I see enough to be relatively confident that if there is anybody who can do for me what I indeed so badly need done, it is God see here's our problem in all of this and let me just be uh, exceedingly honest because I have had plenty of moments where I've been guilty of both of these and when I say moments I don't mean like before I was a Christian or like five years ago when I was just starting at school I mean I have moments in my everyday today Christian life where I'm guilty of both of these things Here's our problem. It's twofold in nature. We don't think we are as bad as we are, and we don't think God is as good as he is. You don't think that you are as bad as you are, and you don't think God is as good as he actually is. That is so often true of you and so often true of me. That is so often true of us in general. And it's something that we've got to address again and again because I am in worse shape than I often think that I am. I've got one or two sins, for instance, that I'm like, oh, those are bad. And I've really spent a lot of time making sure to iron those out of my life and get them out of, out of my life. And that doesn't mean I'm perfect. You know, sometimes I slip up and I say to myself, well, that's really bad. I shouldn't do that. That again or sometimes we say to ourselves well it's not that big a deal if we're being honest we we give ourselves that sort of that sort of treatment but then there's myriad other sins that aren't even on our radars most of the time there's probably plenty of you who could come up to me and say Sam I, I think you really need to work on this and I wouldn't even have thought of that our problem is we often don't think we are as bad as we actually are. I have no idea, even if I'm aware of all of my sins, even if I could give you a perfect list of every sin that I've ever committed and will commit, I have no awareness of the significance and the consequences of those sins, how much it actually matters in the cosmic scheme of things that I have leaned into Satan and away from God multiple times throughout my life. I am clueless no matter how much of an awareness I have, no matter how much I cultivate a sophisticated personal theology, I I do not understand the weight of my sins. You do not understand the weight of your sins and what they have done to Jesus. We just can't comprehend that. There's no tying together of scriptures that can perfectly explain to us how heavy our sin is. I think so many of us, so often as Christians, get so wrapped up in the idea of our own goodness. 
Because we're holy, right? We're redeemed. We're different than people outside this building. That's the kind of thing that we tell ourselves anyways. And we become blind. And we refuse to acknowledge that actually we are still on a path trying to get closer to Jesus. And actually, even after becoming a Christian, sin is still very much a part of our lives. And actually, we still have a lot of room to grow. And that will be true until the day you die. And no matter how good you are or how well you know the Bible or how many verses you have memorized, that does not change. But. Second to all of this is that we often underestimate just how good God is. That's true of people who aren't Christians, sadly, That is true of many Christians. It's true for so many of us. We don't think God is as good as he is. Uh, I talked for a minute in the last sermon in this series about some things that uh, if these are true, you might have a hard time with grace. Remember that list? Uh, One of those things was if you are hard on yourself, you might have a difficult time with grace. And, And that is because... I've found, if you're like anything like me, I have found myself so many times in my life feeling as though God's grace is sufficient for you and not so much for me. That God loves you knowing everything about you, every single thing, that he loves you right now in spite of all that. That his grace is enough to get you through all of that, to sustain his love in the midst of all of that. But for me... I feel like it's a different story. And for those of us tonight who tend to be hard on ourselves, who tend to struggle with grace in that way, maybe we don't find it all that true that often we don't think we are as bad as we are. Maybe we are fully convinced of that. Maybe we struggle where we struggle is the other side where you don't think God is as good as he is. Do you really believe That God is enough for you. That his grace is not only enough to take care of everything that you've done, but also everything that you are still doing and everything that you are going to do throughout the entirety of your life. All of the millions of big ways and millions of small ways that you will continue to fall short. Do you believe that everything God has done to make grace available is available to you? That's a question that I would suggest you need to think about and meditate on and wrestle with and pray through. Because if there's anything that has the power to thwart God's grace in your life, it's you suspecting that there is not enough power in God's grace for your life. And once in our quest just to just come in faith to God and receive this incredible grace that he's offering. Once we have an awareness of our need and we admit that need and we've observed enough about God to trust, and that, 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 that's not knowledge, by the way. Uh, trusting in God is that, that ability to fill in the gaps where your knowledge comes short. And if you know me at all and if you've talked to me much about the Bible, you know how painful and hard that is for me in particular. Because I like knowing things and I love having answers. But trust, meaningful trust in God is being able to say, I don't have all the answers, but I know enough about God to let him fill in those gaps for me. To let his goodness and his mercy take precedence over my own ignorance and guide me through all those hard times. What that means, practically speaking, is that we have to approach God with a posture of surrender. I have to surrender to God. At its core, that's a big part of what faith is. I have to surrender to God in light of my need and in light of his ability to meet my need. And when you don't surrender to God in the light of your need and in light of his ability to meet your need, you put the lid on the jar and you keep grace from getting into your life. 
This is what happens, by the way, in uh, double drownings. You might be familiar with this phenomenon. There's a, there's a thing where when people are drowning and someone else will go out to save them, and the person who's drowning is so panicked, it throws you into the state of shock where you cannot calm down. And so they're fighting against the person who's trying to save them because they don't realize what's going on. And they're hitting and they're punching and they're pulling away. And a lot of the times what happens is they actually end up drowning the person who came to save them. And then they drown themselves. And why does that happen? Because the drowning person is in such a, in such a state of disarray. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Hush Siri, I wasn't talking to you. The drowning person is in such a state of disarray that they are, in not, they are not in any position to surrender to the one trying to save them. Because that's what's necessary in order for a Savior to save. That's why God says it is by grace, through faith. It's not of works lest anyone should boast. But too many of us preface our so-called surrender with a flurry of tax shelter creations and the setting up of offshore accounts. We hear Jesus is coming to town and we start scraping together little loopholes and putting money in corners and trying to protect our sacred golden calf that we don't want him to touch. And we protect these various assets and we, so we don't have to give them up to God. And he comes in and asks us for surrender and we feign it and we pretend like we're doing it. And all the while, all of these pieces of our lives have lids put on them and they become inaccessible to the grace of God. It's not about getting right and coming to him. It's about coming to him and being okay with him doing what it takes to make you right. Whatever that may involve, how many things have to be cut off, how many other things have to be cut off, our surrender to Jesus must be as unconditional as his love is for you and me. So whatever you think you want to quarter off at the beginning of your relationship, and let's be honest, whatever you decide you want to quarter off as your relationship progresses, because we continue to do that with Jesus as we grow closer to him, we say, you can, touch Je you can touch everything, Jesus, except for my love of money, because I work hard for my money, and so I'm going to do with it what I want, unimpeded from the commands that you give me to love and to help and to take care of the poor and needy and to take care of my brothers and sisters in Christ. You can touch and you can fix every part of my life, Jesus, but don't you dare come for my dabbling in legalism, because I'm just trying to be careful so I get a pass in that. Jesus, you can fix everything about my life, but porn's an addiction. And so there's really nothing I can do about it and nothing you can do about it. So let's just move on from that. We say, Jesus, you can have my life, but work and my life are kind of separate things, really. And so I'm not going to bring you up there because that could be uncomfortable and it probably violates some, some uh, HR rules anyways. So... Let's just forget about that. Everything else, fair game, but I'm keeping that to myself. What we do is we tell God where he can operate in our lives, and then we invite him to come in and work on those specific areas, and we do not surrender everything to him, and that's not a relationship with God that is found anywhere in Scripture. God asks for asks for surrender. If you don't surrender, God doesn't win. And if he doesn't win, you lose. You close yourself off to the grace of God in your life. So as we close, let's just sit with one more question. Why faith? I mean, God is the one orchestrating literally all of reality. He could have designed this whole thing any way he wanted to, top to bottom. So why faith? He is the one making these things work, so why is that an essential piece of this puzzle? It's so small anyways, let's just get rid of it and make this whole process a lot neater and a whole lot wider if faith is not a, a part of it. And you'll potentially take away maybe the aspect of choice. Right? Because that makes things a lot simpler. Why grace through faith? Why not just grace no matter what you want? Or why not grace by gunpoint? Why grace 
through faith? Why, if we can't earn it anyways, does it even matter what I do in the first place? Why does he care if I trust him or not? Here's why. Because he wants a relationship with you. He doesn't just want to win you. He wants to love you and he wants to be loved by you. And so he makes himself deeply vulnerable in pursuing that objective. But that is his choice. That is why faith, even as tiny as it is when it comes to the heavy lifting of your salvation, of eliminating sin and death, is still this huge and indispensable piece of the puzzle when it comes to enabling our relationship with God that he wants so deeply to have with every single person who has ever lived lived at any point in time he wants you to choose him but he's already chosen you he's already making his grace available to you that's been done that's a done deal so the question is what are you going to do what do you do with that fountain that is flowing so freely for you and for me? So tonight, if you haven't yet, I would ask you to open your hands. To come to God's fountain and take what he has already poured out for you so you can have all of the blessings that comes from grace there is anything we can do for you. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing?